going to speak about some of the assumptions that I see in the path of development we're taking. So in that sense, more about unsustainability. I wonder if any, any of you have visited Amravati, the dream city that's coming up as the new capital of Andhra Pradesh. Okay. Uh, but also, <coughs> the kind of cities within cities that are emerging across this country. Now in Maharashtra, a state which claims to be having its worst drought in 70 years, and cities are about housing, transportation, water, employment, health, in the state that claims to be having its worst drought in 70 years, probably correctly, these are the kind of houses that are coming up. Okay? One, one, two towers that I'm showing you come to 75 floors. I'm, I'm just about to. <laughs> and believe it or not, it's a swimming pool on every single floor. <laughs> 75 swimming pools in one complex. Can you just put out the light for a bit? Yeah. Don't you just love it? <laughs> uh, so this is two twin towers of 37 floors each and joined together by one penthouse of the builder. So there you get 75. And this is the artist's vision or nightmare as the case may be when it's complete. Mercifully it's not, it's been stymied by, by a lot of noise that a lot of people have made. Um, but it will, it will, it's got clearance. Now, I mean, this is the, you know, a swimming pool on every single floor in a, in a state with its worst water crisis in 70 years. And most of the construction laborers on these sites are marginal, are marginal farmers and agricultural laborers who fled the countryside because there's no water in their villages to conduct their agriculture. Now, this is Mumbai, you know, it's, Garish. Now, in my hometown of Chennai, we are more cultured and refined. So, we have only one swimming pool every third floor. I mean, that's my lap horse, you know that, you know the culture. Uh, and finally, on the road from Mumbai to Pune, every single hoarding, there are hundreds, proclaims gigantic villas, towers, and every one of them with its own exclusive swimming pool. And something, sometimes more than swimming pools, okay? This is uh, on my favorite hoarding on the road from Mumbai to Pune. Luxury homes with an attached forest reserve. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the, in the blessed state of Maharashtra, even the damn tiger doesn't have an attached forest reserve. <laughs> but the builders do. <coughs> so anyway, um, two kilometers from the board are how typical everyday Indians collect their water with the bucket queues. Like she has visited six six different public taps when I had spoken to her that day. Anyway, that's that's just part of the vision that lies ahead for in the real world. Okay. Yeah, and you do what you like, but the builders are going to continue with these constructions, they're going ahead, they will do it. Uh, can we have the lights on again? Thanks. There are many other slides that would entertain you. Oh, maybe maybe there's just one from London, which is coming up there, okay? This is on the same area as the, this is the, the greatest glass swimming pool ever, connecting two towers across the area where the, uh, it's not yet come, mercifully, but it's in the, where the US Embassy is. That's where it's going to come. This is a picture I've taken from the Guardian. And you can see it's pure glass. And there he is swimming exclusively, waving to all you little people down there. So uh, anyway, but the assumptions, OK? One, all the discussions that I run into, the, the multiple debates that I run into are almost, almost all of them. Uh, almost all of them work on an assumption of the inevitability of urbanization. Okay, this is how it has been since the Industrial Revolution, and this is how it will be. Okay, I mean, you, you don't have many other um, options. 
And these are the assumptions, okay? These are assumptions. And I have serious problems with those assumptions, which include, I mean, if you go back, say, if you look at the kind of writing that I find on the op-ed pages elsewhere, the analysis, it's planning ahead for the cities, for the mega cities. China, by the way, is now planning a mega, mega, mega city which will host, which will be home to 130 million people. It's called Jingjiangji or something exotic, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Again, the assumption is that this is the only way you will go. There are no other options. This is the way history moves. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, what happened, okay? Industrial Revolution in Britain, hundreds of thousands of peasants <laughs> thrown off the land. They hightail it to the city in mass migrations. There's mass misery for a while. That allows it Dickens and Engels to do some writing. And, but capitalism works in the long run, so everybody, after a while, everything improves. And uh, there are better conditions, better wages. Where urban is always better than the rural. So it is in the nature of urbanization, industrialization, and industrial capitalism to improve <coughs> things after a generation or two or 20. Uh, incidentally, it's worth noting that the USA, this, this is the first generation in the United States, first generation of Americans whose living standards are lower than the previous generation. That is the very first generation of the United States that has that figure. Here's a big problem with this assumption. It didn't actually happen this way. Okay? When hundreds of thousands, you're, we are completely ignoring the discussion, the mass migrations out of England and Europe that took place between 1815 and 1910, which was 50 million people, as <coughs> Professor Prabhat Patnaik very beautifully points out in a powerful article. 16 million human beings migrated out of Britain between 1815 and 1910. In the base year, Britain's population was 12 million, which means that the half the annual average increase was being exported to the white colonies of Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, and even India. Okay? Now, I don't see that <clears throat> the developing countries have those options, unless you want to go and massacre a couple of hundred million Bengalis to the east. And I know you don't want to take on the one on the west. Right. So you don't have, the, the North American miracle was constructed in percentage terms of the largest genocide in history. Okay. Now, these are not options open. These are not even, these are not even to be dreamt of in nightmares, that kind of option. But we continue with this. And by the way, the wages did improve in England. They did improve in Europe, as they would if 50 million poor people migrated and labor have commands a better price. We don't have that option. For us to equal what happened in that period, as Professor Patnak points out, it would require that about 400 million Indians migrated between 1947 and 2010. Not happening. So let's not even get there. But there are, let me get back to the dream city of uh, the cities and the assumptions. I think David Harvey put it very well a few months ago in, in, in one of the meetings that I heard him at. We're talking about cities, you're talking about sustainable cities, but we are no longer building cities for people to live in. We are building cities for investors, like your <laughs> buildings with every swimming, every floor having a swimming pool. You're building, you're building cities for the rich to invest in, not for citizens to live in. Okay? Now, uh, in, <laughs> in Mumbai, the new, new landmark of Mumbai is not the gateway of India. It is Mr. Ambani's mansion on, uh, you know, in, in, uh, alongside Pedder Road. You can, I mean, you can see it from anywhere. <laughs> it's that ugly. Okay? <laughs> 27 floors actually built to a height of 60 floors because he has claustrophobia, I think. So each the roof is double height in each floor. There's five floors of parking, apparently. You know, I mean, these are the cities that are being built. Affordable housing has a serious crisis worldwide, but there isn't much anything being done about putting up affordable housing. Also, there are other assumptions involved in the rush towards the mega city, the smart. <coughs> I think smart cities are a pretty dumb idea. Okay? Just go and look at just go and look at Amravati. 
50, I mean, the Chinese case is, of course, extreme, 82,000 square kilometers. It will include Beijing, the mega, mega city of 130 million people. But look at Amravati. Mr. Naidu again gets that kind of uncritical applause from the media and, uh, and the PR industry uh, for his great doings in Amravati. 50, now, cities are supposed to be inclusive. They're supposed to accept the refugees from the countryside. As a matter of fact, this city is based on displacing tens of thousands of people. It displaces massive numbers of agricultural laborers. It takes over 52,000 square, kilom uh, uh, square kilometers, um, out of which the greater, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very sorry. It takes over 7,325 square kilometers for the greater capital region and 125 square kilometers for Amravati, <laughs> capital city itself. Out of the 52,000 acre, uh, out of the 52,000 acres it has taken, 38,000 are fertile land. Much of it triple crop land or high-end horticulture, or even you know bananas, the works. The agricultural labor, laborers who are going to get thrown off here are going to get a pension. It's promised, not delivered, of less than what you would earn on the NREGS in the same state on 20 days is what they will get as their pension in a month. Okay. How sustainable is that? Then there is yet another assumption involved. As you go towards this, one is the nature of indu the industrialization and employment is one assumption. Industrialization and uh, employment is one assumption. And the other assumption is food production. We seem to have accepted worldwide, we seem to have accepted that Agriculture can't hold so many people, though, by the way, it still accounts for one out of every three people working in the world are in some way connected or engaged with agriculture. We're going to go for the North American model, where eventually 2% will take care of agriculture, which means handing over food production entirely to large corporations and agribusiness, which you will find in the top 20 of the Fortune 500 lists of fastest growing companies every year that you care to look. You're going to hand over your entire food production to these guys. Yeah. As a matter of fact, even today, the FAO's much compromised reports still tell us that the bulk of the world's food comes maybe in one estimate as high as 70%, in other estimates 50% and more, come from small and marginal farms, from small farmers. We don't recognize that because most of that food is consumed on the farm, since these are subsist many of them are subsistence farmers. However, you're going to create, look at the employment crisis already in Indian agriculture. Between 1991 census and 2011 census, we have 15 million full-time farmers less. That is, you're losing full status farmers at the rate of 2,000 a day. Where are they going? They're becoming agricultural laborers because that population is exploding. In, in the unified state of Andhra Pradesh, there's a fall in the last 10 years of 1.3 million farmers, but an increase of 3.4 million agricultural laborers. Okay, you're creating a nightmare situation. Where is the employment in the cities? In Mumbai, the great mills of the 60s, 50s, and 40s, all those mills are now real estate. By the way, one of them is actually called Planet Godridge. It is a different planet. You know, yeah, it's the only part of region of Maharashtra where school enrollment is falling severely because the working classes have moved out of central Mumbai. Completely, they've been ousted from their place. So this is the employment calculations are extremely dangerous, and they're wrong, and they're false. Lastly, there is also the assumption, I mean, there's the food production thing, as I said. <coughs> I think when you all, there is another implication to handing over the things to the large corporations, there is another thing. You're going to be running agriculture entirely on steroids. Mm -hmm. That's about what, mm -hmm. that's, that's the direction we're going in. I'm saying I think we need to question this whole idea that there is only one way. This was the way it has to happen. This is the way it has to go. You know? There is no other path. You have to retread the ground of what didn't happen in the Industrial Revolution, but we believe that it did. So there is, I think, a serious thing, a serious thought. Oh, by the way, in, in Maharashtra itself, in the same places where you saw all the swimming pools, the data coming out on RTI shows us that the cities receive 400% more water than the villages. 
and three cities, three cities in a state of 115 million, 55% rural, three cities get 53% of the water, Mumbai, Mumbai, Pune and Thani. Three cities get 53% of the water of a state of 115 million. I think we are begging for crisis and then looking very innocent and injured when it comes. I believe you need to say that there, I believe we need to think that there are other ways of doing this, much better ways of doing this that can actually be sustained. Thank you. Thank you.